Gattis is here too, gives a talk. Uh, Gattis is with Deep Data Intelligence. I don't know what that is, he'll tell us. Um, and uh, you're going to talk about data pipelines. Yep. Thank Please you. welcome Gattis. Thank you. So, in, uh, in 1431, <laughs> a merchant by the name of John Beer was travelling from Hampshire to London. On his cart, John had one pound of cheese and one quarter of quicklime, a quarter being a, 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 unit, volu a unit volume in that time. Um, on market day, he sets up his stall and puts his goods on for sale. Uh, the first customer arrives and inquires about the cheese. The customer says, I would like one pound of cheese. Oh, sit there. <laughs> <laughs> the customer says, I require, uh, I would like one pound of cheese. And John Beer is like, oh, excited, he might have a sale. And John, um, uh, and the customer asks, how much, how much does it cost? John says, ah, for one, uh, he had bought one, uh, one pound of cheese in Hampshire for 15 pence. He, he says, one pound of cheese in London is 10 pence. Uh, so then the, uh, the, the customer is like, oh, it's a very good uh, deal. Uh, cheese in Hampshire is very good, and I would love to have some cheese for my dinner and for breakfast tomorrow. So they exchange the goods and exchange the money, and both John and the customer are happy with the transaction. After a while, uh, a builder comes and inquires about some quicklime, quicklime being used in building or construction. And uh, John had bought one quarter, which is a unit volume, in um, Hampshire for 90 pence. And he says to the customer, it costs, for one quarter in London, it costs 15 pence. And then the customer thinks, oh, yes, I can really build. This is good quicklime. Hampshire makes some good quicklime. I can really build my home with this quicklime or whatever, whatever they use it for. Um, so again, they exchange the goods for money. And both John and the customer are happy with the transaction. So my question for the audience is, why were both John and the customer happy with the transaction? I would like some hands up or think a while. <laughs> no, John's a good businessman. John is a very good, well, he's a good businessman. Different units? Different units. So in 1431 in Hampshire, a pound was not the same as a pound in London. Well, that's, this, I'll, I'll tell you how this leads into data and pi data, but it's, it, it, it's, it's very applicable, it's very applicable. Same thing with a quarter. A quarter was a standard measure uh, back there, but it wasn't the same in all these different regions around uh, Britain. In fact, uh, the word for pound comes from the word pondus, in case you want to know. So what did John Beer have to do to sell his product in 1431? He had to find, in Hampshire, he had to find what the measurement system was in that place, what the quality of the goods were, what, find out the vendors, what good vendors are, there might be a multiple vendors, what the price of those goods were in the local currency. He had to know the language, the dialect in Hampshire. Maybe they have certain words that use for certain areas or some technicalities. Uh, what the currencies are, different currencies, are also a problem in 1431. You have lots of different currencies in Britain. What, what kind of storage was he going to have? Um, before he shipped off his goods at the source. What were the laws and religious uh, customs of that area? Then on the transportation, what roads was he going to use? Was he going to use roads? When he, was he going to go by ship to London? Uh, what kind of security did, did he need to have to transport his goods from Hampshire to London? Did he have to pay a convoy of security? Was he going to go on a group of uh, merchants that go together, which is uh, what they did in 1431 as well? Uh, what, was, what packaging was he going to use to transport his goods? And finally, the destination, where you had to do a lot of the same things. In London, what, were the, what was the measurement system? What was the quality? What was the price? Language, dialect, currencies? Were there any levies? What was the storage? How was he going to store it? What are the laws and religious customs of 1431? And that, you'd have to agree, is a massive job just to sell a bit of cheese and a bit of quicklime. A massive job. So what's the, um, what's the answer to John's problem? Standardization. The problem is, 
Hampshire and London are, don't have the same standards. John had to understand the price of the goods in his destination before even buying the goods. He had to have this whole planned out, all of it planned out, and uh, the travel transport of information back in that time was very slow. So it's, it's a risky venture for John to take uh, the cheese and the quicklime to London. So what he can't really do is, by the way here, he can't really scale. It's very hard for him to add uh, another product. What they... Um, scale. scale, yeah, it's a good... Uh, in, in, <laughs> he also said it's a bit cheesy, this. <laughs> uh, he likes his puns. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I've lost my train of thought. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this yeah, scale. So... It's very hard to add a new project, a product because he'd have to go through all this process again and keep on monitoring the process as he transports his good from A to B. Um, what they tended to do back then is go to get imp increased profits was to go into quality because assuring quality for one good was much easier than to scale out horizontally. Yeah. Standardization. So the first, so I've, I've done the research here. So all of these, these are actual records that I found. I feel that finding, understanding history is a good indicator for knowing what to do, because many of these problems have been solved in the past. So in 1959, there's an ordinance by King Edgar, which was the standardization of money in different er areas, and what, what he tried to do. He was somewhat successful. In 1215, the Magna Carta tried to uh, standardize weight and I think it was length. The biggest change happened in 1824, with a Weights and Measures Act. However, I would like to read out the top one for you in 1924, which is quite late. Um, for there are still in use 25 local corn weights and measures, 12 different bushels, 13 different pounds, 10 different stone, and nine different tons in 1924. This is after the First World War which is, how the hell did they conduct a war? Like, how, <laughs> how, how did the quartermaster say, I, I need this from you, I need that from you, it must have been a mental undertaking. Uh, but uh, I'll just read out another part. Why was this the case? The um, examination of, oh, no, no, that's not right. Uh, when confronted by local customs so strong that many have survived to the present day. So the problem is not a technological one, the problem is a human one. How can, how can you convince these people that, this, that you should standardize the way that you transport goods and that you have the same language throughout that process? So, so this is very similar to a data engineer's problem or the problem that you face. You, when you get data, you get them in many different, uh, from many different sources, databases, FTP, API, S3, file shares, HTML. Uh, you might do web scraping, all these areas to get your data. They come in many different formats. You've got JSON, XML, CSV, ORK, or some weird format that somebody on some vendor created just to put in a LinkedIn profile. And then you have to work with and spend weeks trying to decide to understand what, what actually he intended to do. Uh, then they come in many different compression formats, zip, uh, zip, Targi Z, uh, G Zip, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, zip and Targi Z are awful formats, in my opinion, but we can talk about that later. Don't ever do it. I'm just saying, please don't ever do it. Okay. And then what you really have is you can have all these different for, uh, sources with all these different formats, with all these different compression types, and it's really a cross joint problem. And what you really want is to get your data into your data warehouse in a two dimensional format. On the left, you have multi, multi dimensional data, on the right, you have Two dimensions, this is where your stakeholders are consuming your data. And it's even more complicated. It's not just a relational database. We have an, you can have analytical column stores, you can have schema on read. Which ones do you use? How can I make a simple enough process that is maintainable enough for me to have a data warehouse which you can have a large variety of data? A data warehouse has two things, which, or at least two things that make it work well. One, it has to have a large variety of data. Uh, the data warehouse is the modern paradigm of a library. If a library only has one topic, not many people are going to go to that library and read its books. Um, the second thing, it has to be tr a trusted source of information. If I'm not getting my data, 
when I expect it to be there, then I'm, I'm not really going to uh, use that for my systems that I produce later on. So how do I, what kind of way can I do this so I don't have to code it all the same way every, uh, or I have to code it in different ways for every single one of my pipelines. So the only bit of Python I actually have in this talk is that. <laughs> Anybody know where that's from? Yeah, yeah good. It's a bit more complicated than simple, but we'll get, we'll get into it. So let's start off what we have to do. We have our source data, and this is our data infrastructure where we'll be doing our work. And we have our data warehouse, which is the, typically the place where people consume their data. Right? It's like the SQL queries join different data sets together and get their data out. Uh, you have your data lake. Uh, who here knows what a data lake is or has used a data lake? Show of hands, please. Uh, OK, that's quite a lot. OK, who, who hasn't? Maybe I should have asked that question. <laughs> OK, oh, 50-50, OK. So um, a, a quick introduction to data lakes. A data lake is, imagine on your computer, your files and folders where you can save uh, your data. A data lake is something on, a, on the cloud where you can, anybody that you allow can have access to that data. It's one central place. Whereas if it's on a server, the server might go down. The server, you can't request it with API transactions. Um, uh, but you can on a data lake, and it's meant to be scaled out, and you can have a lot of data on there. Some typical examples are uh, Amazon Web Services S3, there's Digital Ocean Spaces, there's, I think it's Google Storage, uh, some other ones. Cloud Storage. Cloud storage. Okay. So then uh, let's look at the top. We have a compute layer and a storage layer, right? And this is how we're going to work through it. So the first process is you want to extract your data. Now this by far, please, if you're going to remember anything, please remember this bit right there. Um, when you extract your data, save your data in its raw form somewhere in your data lake. It can be in your folder file system, but save it in its raw form. That means if you get a HTML website, if you're, web, if you're scraping a website, uh, you should save that website in its raw HTML form um, to get it later. Why is that important? So if I'm web scraping something, and let's say my, my um, so typically what people do, they extract the data, they, or they, they scrape it on the fly from the live uh, website, and then put it into the database. But let's say that process is broken, and I uh, scrape something that's not actually correct. If I don't have the actual saving extracted file, I can never go backwards in time. That data is always lost, and I'll never have it again. So you should be saving your data as soon as you get it. The next process is a transform and load process. This is very uh, simple as it goes. So, but the cogs here are compute, and the lower level is the storage. Yeah? Um, so which is where you take your data, and you transform it and load it on the fly right into your uh, data warehouse to be consumed. And that is a very good pipeline. It has very few nodes. The data is going from left to right. That's, it, it's pretty good. However, sometimes what happens is, you might need to transform your data and save it as files again. Right? So this is where you have another transform phase, and after that, you load that into your data set. Uh, however, this is not as good as the first method, because let's say that I have a problem in my data. I'm looking at the main table. I'm querying it, and I see, oh, this row's really weird. Uh, why is it weird? You have to try and investigate back into those previous nodes where that raw original format is. So if I have a transform layer, well, that's not the original source of the data. I might have to go back to the extracted layer. Having like, like this is much easier to find where the original problem was. Does that make sense so far? Just some nods? Yeah? OK. Ah, OK. So that's a good framework. However, you're not. Uh, you don't have, you're not sure whether you're, the data you're getting is correct or not. Something throughout your process could be incorrect, and the data that your stakeholder is getting is wrong. It's very important that your stakeholder gets the right data. If I'm buying um, a product off the supermarket, I shouldn't have to look inside the product to see what, what it is in there. I should have the, the, the confidence of knowing that the data I'm querying is fine. I shouldn't have to valid, the end user shouldn't have to validate that data. So we had a validation stage at the extract phase. So let's say I'm calling an API. And oh, so let's do a web scraper. Um, I'm scraping a website. I expect on that website to have these fields, that this data would exist, that table would exist uh, in that HTML website. Uh, if it doesn't, 
then save that data into an extracted failed area so you can have a look at what the problem was and change your, your function or methodology to understand how things have changed throughout the process. Next thing what you should do is validate your data before it's given to your stakeholder or before you consume it or for whatever reason. Have a validation, put your data into a staging table, then have a validation function or validation SQL query that you run on your data that says, ah, is this data like the one I expect it to be? So there's two real areas I've seen where you can validate. You can validate on the, on like the, not, um, like, the, is the schema correct, if it's schema on read, or you can val validate on the business logic that happens in that data that you get. So for example, um, I should be, be expecting these three values in my data. Am I sure that that data is there? Uh, no. If it's no, then you fail it. If it's yes, then it carries on. And then you need monitoring and all these different processes to say where, where is it breaking, where is it working, and that, that should always, you should always be informed of that. In fact, what you should be doing is you should have a, this goes more into data as a product. Your final consumer should be able to see the monitoring that happens on your data. When they consume your data, they should be like, oh, this, this has been reliable for um, a, a year, two years, nothing is broken. Your uh, managers should be able to see that your processes are working well, and you should be able to see that your process, processes are working well, and where they fail if they do. If, if they fail, it's not your fault. It's not always your fault. Remember that data is dirty, and you have to think of a good process to clean that data. And when it fails, you go back to it, and you clean it, and you understand what the problems are. So as a result of this, you have two situations. So as time goes on, this is what you'd like to do. You'd like your data to be trickling into your, uh, your database. But let's say that we have a validation fail in this area. So two situations can happen. We can either, so we get our data, we stop it, and no more data goes in. Or it fails some number of processes, but we get snippets of that data in. Which one do we use? Do we use the, uh, the middle one or the bottom one? Is the middle? Anybody want to elaborate why middle or why the bottom? Please. The bottom. Uh, middle because otherwise you have no idea where the holes are. Possible, but you could you could find that out with a validation SQL query. Or yes, you the, the end consumer is correct. They won't know where the holes are, and they'll assume that the whole data is fine. But actual fact, you can have either. It's just the stakeholder should be aware of which one you're using when you publish that data. <laughs> If they're, if they're happy with writing their SQL queries that there could be gaps in it, that's fine. But they should be aware of that process. In general, yes, the middle one is what you should be aiming for. So what happens is then you go back, it's failed, you check what the problem is, you fix the code, you, you improve it, and then your data continues going forward. Or you go down to each little gap and you fill it in. Yeah? So let's go through some principles of what I've described here so far. So the main important thing is understanding your data consumer. What, what by far, what do they want? Do they want streaming? How, uh, how quick do they need their information and their insights? Do they need it in seconds? Do they need it in hours? Do they need it in days? That will affect the technology that you use. If you look at the diagram, I haven't put really any technology on there. I've just put cogs. All right, I've put an S3 bucket, but you can use whatever you want for that. This has just been from principles, building that up, right? And understanding your data consumer and, all, and your data will determine what you use during, in those cog processes. Um, keep your data in its raw form. I think we understand why. We don't want to lose any of our data. Uh, don't delete or move, or move your raw data. Once it's landed, that should be it. It should be very little time that you go back and try to fix the problems in your data. Um, your transformation of your data should happen over all of time and not just at the present moment. You should be able to go back throughout your data and say like, ah, um, from five years ago up to now, my transformation function extracts the data I want from my extracted layer into my main table perfectly well. And that is the data engineer's problem, really, is to maintain that transformation stuff. You do not want to maintain other things, just that. Uh, separate out your extract and transform load process. You don't want one to fail and the other to continue, or the, uh, sorry. You don't want that, you want them to be separate processes that happen by themselves. Uh, minimize the number of data and compute nodes. If I have too many nodes in my system, um, I have more chance for bugs to crop up, more error to happen. So by having only two, 
um, I have a less of a chance of anything actually ha going wrong. Um, let's skip that one. Make your ET ETL acyclical, which means data should only flow in one direction. Uh, I've seen some companies have databases which refer to other databases and they cycle around and they refer back to itself. What is the true source of your data anymore? It's, it could actually be lost, you have no idea. Even in databases, how you structure a database, you should, if you create a new table, it should be in an acyclical nature. It should only go in one direction. Uh, validate your data before it goes to its consumers. Joining should happen at the database level, in my opinion. That's what SQL is made for. Um, your pipeline should get the data in there. If you want to join it with something, do it on there. And then monitor your data. You need to know how well it's working. This is very similar to what, what, to what John had to do. He had to understand the data, or understand his product, uh, understand uh, where his destination and where he was going to. He had to under he, didn't, he shouldn't have to delete or move his, data, or his product too much around lots of different areas. He, he, was looking at, he was validating the data to make sure that, or validating his product to make sure it was a good enough quality to, set, to give to his final consumer. He was separating out his ETL, so he was buying the goods, transporting them, putting them somewhere else, and he probably had infrastructure in place for all of those things. Um, uh, he was joining his data at the database level, so that means that he was maybe giving it to a wholesaler or a supermarket, so he could be uh, join it with other goods as well. So, final thing I uh, want to leave with you. You should think data, of data as a product. Um, just how you go into a supermarket and you buy something. You should be able, or uh, even in library really, you should be able to search for something and find where that data is without having, ha having to investigate that data and look inside that data for what it actually has. Um, yes, that's it. Um, my company is Deep Data Intelligence. Uh, look at us online, that's my LinkedIn profile. These are the references I've used and found about John Beer, who was actually a person in 1431. Um, any questions? So yeah, thank you for that, Gattis. So go ahead. Very interesting talk. So if the requirement or the customer isn't sure of what data they would need in the first place, is there any area of the pipeline that we can work on anyways. So just, I think sometimes we don't know what the uh, data or the requirement will be. Is there any other areas that say, say without having access to the data first in the first time, um, what, are this, what are the things that we can do anyhow to just to prepare for that? Okay. Um, I would say, uh, so if the customer doesn't know what data they need before they consume it, it's very hard to know if I think of an analogy, if they walk into a supermarket and they don't know what they're going to buy, how do they know what they're going to find? Well, it's really the question that they have. Um, there's, if they have a, if they think about what question are they trying to solve, um, and then find the data from that question that could solve that question for them. I mean, you've got a large variety of data sets that exist on the internet and exist data vendors that can give you that data. Uh, and I think going to them and understanding a bit more about what they're trying to solve before looking for the data would be a, a better option, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. If, Sorry. If you read uh, Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott, which you may, ha may have, it goes into a lot of the fascinating history of the fight to impose standardized weights and measures. And it turned out that a lot of the opposition to standardized weights and measures was simply to avoid things like um, uniform taxation across the country, so they're actually kind of arbitrage and, and misreport and all that kind of thing. Is there any parallel to that in, in the data pipeline? <laughs> I, I think so, yes. Like, if you make a process easier, if you automate a process, there'll be less people doing jobs, or there'll be less jobs for it. There'll be less data enge engineers doing the work. Um, so yes, the more standardization. But frankly, uh, I had a very good talk uh, that said, we should, we sh this, is, um, this is something that we shouldn't be doing. What we should be doing is going to the moon, 
frankly, I feel like I'm a postman for the internet. I'm just getting data from one place to another. It should be such a trivial thing. Like, screw it. I want to do more interesting things than this, right? This is, this is to get an insight out. Stone age of the data world. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I, I was just wondering uh, about all the schema that you showed. Um, often, I actually find myself as a stakeholder because as a data scientist, we often are stakeholders of those data because we have to query them, uh, that I have to investigate exactly this and do the validation or suggest, suggest the validation. Yep. And all you've spoken about makes very sense. I, uh, my curiosity is all about the very end when you talk about the main data that are already in the database. Do you envisage at all um, an additional validation stage where you can check actually that what you query, that the query itself gives what you would expect? Hmm. So I normally, when I'm making data engineering programs, I do that at that stage. So I will make a union of the two data sets and compare that the, the, if I run a query, that gives me the same result as it should be getting out at the end. So I can put it in there. Okay. And finally, just a joke. Do you have any recommendations for English people in terms of uh, adopted European units of measurements? <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> Next question. I wanted to ask about the monitoring step. Yep. So usually, uh, what would you recommend as the best practice to monitor after each and every step or monitor at the end after everything is done? If you're starting from scratch? Yeah. Airflow, wicked way to go. Monitor your data sets through that. You can use Jenkins to do it. Not as good, in my opinion. Um, you can have monitoring that. So in Jenkins, you can create Jenkins files, uh, which has certain blocks of code you can have, and it'll tell you where you go through those blocks when it when the code fails and for what uh, why it fails. Uh, if you're writing your code in Python, you have a lot of exceptions. Create your own custom exceptions for different problems. I normally have, for example, a, val a validation function that will spin off different custom exceptions based on the problem that, that happens. So you can find out what the problem is much more easily than investigating what the data issue is. But in terms of monitoring, I would say Airflow is a good one. I hear there's not much documentation on Airflow. I wonder what there's, there's not, but um, I'll go for that route. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, I just wanted to like take a suggestion whether, say for example, you are doing an extract step. So do we monitor that extract step at, at that time of implementation only or hold up? Once whole pipeline is developed, then you go to the monitoring step. Uh, so you're saying if you add an extra step, do no, you? I'm saying that say for example you implement a extract yep. a step in the pipeline. Yeah. So do you, after implementing that step, uh, apply monitoring or at the end of the uh, whole pipeline development? Uh, right there. Uh, the if if it depends on the time constraints that you have in building your code. Um, you should build it throughout the process of when you're writing your extraction functions. In fact, what you should be doing is even standardizing the way that you extract data. So what I do in my, uh, what I taught my data engineers and what I've implemented is for all these different databases, I have created Python code that extracts data from databases, FTP sites, API, S3, in a standardized format. You give it some configuration and then it will spin out the monitoring for you or the validation stuff for you during that process. So you don't have to code it a thousand times for the same thing. Better? Yeah. Um, if you go back to the process map, well, uh, a couple after, I think. Yeah, exactly. Do you do most of the data cleaning? And by data cleaning, I mean here like requirements for data types in the extract phase or in the transform and load phase? That depends on what your data source is. So okay. if you're consuming from a, a database, um, it's not well, how, it's hard to read a JDBC connection. Um, uh, if you're doing it from an API, it's much easier to do. So you can't always do it from all data sources, but you should try to do as much as possible. In fact, databases are quite a different um, data source by themselves. What you should be hopefully doing is connecting straight to the database, and th that, that solves your problem. Uh, 
But yeah, sometimes you can't always validate your data. Let's uh, thank Gatis. <laughs>